welcome and once again to Cinema Ho- I, I I messed it up. No, keep it, keep it, keep it going. Welcome once again to Cinema Holics, a major motion podcast where we talk about the biggest and best films coming to theaters and streaming online. From the San Francisco Bay Area, I'm John Negroni, film editor for InBetweenDrafts.com, and from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he's a freelance film writer, and he wanted me to say to everyone that he's a bottom. It's Will Ashton. I don't know why you want to tell everybody that. I feel like you're giving way too much too early. <laughs> I am so excited you know, to talk about this movie with you, Will. I'm excited too. Yeah, it's one of my. Uh, it was one of my most anticipated films of summer. You listeners may have remembered that when we were talking about like our summer movie preview. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we mentioned the movie a few times over the summer. It came out in August. We're getting to it a bit late. We have been uh, really behind this past month. We're now into September. And the movies have been slowing down since the end of the summer. We haven't even caught up a little bit on the summer at large. It was a weird one. Uh, We don't have to get into all that today. We can just focus on this movie. I mean, it was like the fat, one of the last movies to come out of the summer, one of the last notable ones. And I think like just to get ahead of it a little bit, uh, we're about to explain what the movie is and everything. But this is a tough one because this is one we were both looking forward to. Mm -hmm. My expectations were pretty high. Sure. I and I remember, you know, mentioning to you that I was concerned that my expectations were too high. So I was like, you know what? I should manage my expectations. And uh, I've revealed a little bit already ahead of time that, you know, critics like this movie a lot. They love it. They they can't, you know, everybody's a bottom this summer. (laughs) This summer, everyone's bottoming up. Mm -hmm. And well, I, I. I, I'm I'm the lame one, the nerd, the one who doesn't like sure. it. At, at least not as much. I, I don't like it much. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, for you. I mean, I've been hoping that you would. Uh, uh, that it's just me. That something's wrong. It's okay. But I have to be honest. It's okay. I'd rather be honest. It's just fine. You're old. You're a guy. Is that it? You uh, you. I hate? just can't connect with the the, the Gen Zers anymore. That's right. Yeah. You, or whatever. You, you are an old millennial, and you hate women. That's the reason why you didn't like bottoms. <laughs> Aww. It's funny that though I've seen plenty of people much older than me sure. really like this movie a lot and be like, you know what, this movie's hilarious. I didn't laugh much at all in this mm-hmm. movie, but here's here's what it's about. I'll stop burying the lead. All right, so this is from Anna Seligman, who co-wrote it with Rachel Sennett. They did a movie that we both really liked called Shiva Baby. Yes. It came out in 2020, I want to say. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it premiered in 2020 at TIFF. Yeah. And then it came out in, I want to say, limited theatrical in 2021. Yeah. I remember seeing it like just, I think, like on a screen or something. Right. I really liked Shiva Baby. Great movie. We talked about it on the show. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I that felt like a real discovery to me because... Um, if you remember, I I don't know. I feel like I snuck my way into the the 2020 Toronto International Film Festival. They somehow let me in with a press <laughs> accreditation, but it was like all online, so you could kind of just pick and choose whatever. It was maybe the best fee, uh, film festival experience of my life for that reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I remember picking Shiva Baby because I was vaguely familiar with Rachel Sinat like through Twitter. And I, I was also intrigued because it was like, well, it's 79 minutes. Whether I like it or I don't, I'm going to, you know, it's going to go in and go out. But, uh, yeah, I, I, that ended up being, I think, the best surprise of that festival. And that was a really great festival. There were some really good movies that came from there. But, yeah, I remember I was telling you early on, like, you got to get this movie on your radar. Like, you got to check it out. Uh, and you did. And I was nervous that time because I was like, oh, maybe John will like it. Maybe I was, you know, a little too over... Uh, overhyping it but well you correctly predicted that it would be my thing that movie had a very great energy to Mm -hmm. it it's all about a shiva where this young um she's bisexual but like her ex-girlfriend is at this shiva and also the guy that like she's been selling sex to is there and it's just like this pressure cooker of a movie it's like a comedic tense comedy but it's obviously got some drama to it and it's just so electric and it's so like fun to watch and I mean, that movie just moves. Molly Gordon is in it. Diana Agron. It's a great cast. Um, was was Fred Malamud in that movie, too? Yes. So you know I love that man. <laughs> I couldn't leave uh, him out. Yeah. I know he. you you are a big fan. And of course. Yeah. So I after that, I was, you know, I was like, Rachel, like Rachel Sennett. Like, I think that she's she's great. She's a great actress. She's a young actress. Mm-hmm. Uh, she also had a movie called Bodies, Bodies, Bodies last year. Yep. A movie that I, I forget how you know, exactly you landed on so, it. I thought it was okay. No, I, I remember we were pretty split on that one. Like, I feel like 
we we bonded. We got together over Shiva Baby, and then since then, when it comes to Sanat's uh, filmography, we've kind of detoured a little bit because I I remember being disappointed by Bodies Bodies Bodies. Um, I thought she was great. Like I thought she was totally tuned in and gave the right performance to that movie. But I felt like the movie itself let her down. Like it didn't feel like it totally quite got what it was going for. It had a good ending, but I love that ending. That ending is one of my favorite movie endings of that yeah. whole summer. I just feel like the movie didn't really deserve that ending. Like I, I feel like it, it, <laughs> it didn't quite reach the heights that it should have. But like I said, I mean, I, I, I don't want to overhype it. I just I liked it a lot. I thought it was a nice movie. Yeah, but I do think that movie did help because uh, I don't know how many people end up seeing Shiva Baby. I, I know it was a you know obviously a festival darling as we were noting, but. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies was the A24 film. And I think that movie really helped to pave the way for something like Bottoms uh, being, yeah. you know, kind of this, uh, you know, a uh, little movie that could like a big uh, South by Southwest uh, favorite. And then now it's becoming obviously a big critical darling, as you mentioned. I don't know how it's doing at the box office, but I feel like it's doing at least steady business, you know, as far as uh, raunchy comedies go. Not a lot of them uh, this summer have been doing very well, as, as we have talked about in the past. But it seems like compared to the budget, this one's holding steady, which is good. Because I think, you know, I know you're in the minority, as you mentioned, but I think people are really responding to this movie. And I definitely have uh, they are. Um, my uh, uh, ideas for why I think that is. But, um, you know, I just think well, first. Yeah, go ahead. First. I want to, I don't want to lose track on this. I, I just wanted to say with Shiva baby, very underwatched. And part of that is yes, it, it was a festival darling, but it, it came out during the pandemic time. It came out at a time when people weren't watching stuff, um, as readily that was like indie fair like that, unless it was streaming on something that was very available yeah. right now. You can stream it on max, but like, it just doesn't have that same. Oomph. Like if it was on Netflix, I think pe- more people would have discovered it. But I think Max is a different story because that's just an app where I think it's it's a bit of a wasteland in terms of things catching on. Uh, but it's box office, uh, Shiva Baby's box office, I mean, not even half a million sure. dollars. So that's kind of what we're looking at. But I mean, it was an extremely low budget movie. It was not a flop. In fact, they didn't really have to market it much. And, you know, it's made plenty of money at this point, right? Yeah, and I mean, I feel like Shiva Baby would benefit now from being discovered, particularly. Yeah coming off of bottoms because i feel like it um it was obviously riding the wave of like sort of the nervous energy that like the safety brothers movies have but also kind of predated something like the bear which people i feel like are really responding to that kind of same like adrenaline and anxiety i, I mean i haven't watched the show as, as you've uh, berated me for but uh it, it's kind They're of kind of of a kind like they, they really are. Right. And there is a little bit of like a cinematic universe happening here sure. with Rachel Sennett, Molly right. Gordon, who's in the bear, Io Debris, who's in the bear, oh, yeah. Io Debris and um, Rachel Sennett have worked together before, I think like in Comedy Central. Yeah. Like this is like a group of like, I'm, I'm kind of generalizing here, but they strike me as like a bunch of NYU grads who are good friends mm-hmm. and show up in each other's stuff a lot. Yeah. And they're like all around the same age kind of, yeah, like you said, they, they seem to really have a good camaraderie. I'm just guessing they went to NYU. Right. I don't even know if that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fair guess. Um, right. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I saw like some sort of, uh, Venn diagram that someone made. I think it was on Twitter where like they were <laughs> proving that like, it's like, uh, insane that Molly Gordon wasn't in bottoms because like, there are so many crossovers and parallels with those three stars that like, uh statistically she probably should have been in it uh, i don't know which role she would have played but um but yeah i mean it just seems like uh i mean not to get off top you know off track too much but yeah i mean i do think there's definitely an <laughs> audience late. for shiva baby and i i will say i definitely think that's the better of the two films like i think that's a lot more uh you know uh well-rounded captivating i, I think there are definitely some problems with bottoms that uh come from its more loose kind of more go for broke approach but uh, obviously, I have a lot more kind things to say if you wanted to at least one negative to start off to kind of uh, extend it all a branch here. Now, I, I don't know what the the budget was for bodies, bodies, bodies. I think it was pretty low, but I do think that bottoms, I'm pretty sure bot- bottoms either has like a comparable budget or maybe a little bit higher. And it's already gra- grossed about half of what bodies, bodies, bodies did. 
um, in just a couple of weeks and most of that a limited run. Now that's $7.6 million. Uh, bodies, bodies, bodies did not do super well. I mean, it, it only made about 14 million. Mm. Uh, it's saving grace is that it wasn't a big budget movie. I think the problem with that movie is I do think they spent a lot of money on marketing. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't think that one was successful, but I think bottoms totally different story. I think this is a bit more successful, has more buzz, has a little bit more of like a cult film status, like already, sure, yeah. like almost by default. And you know, it's, it's the kind of movie that I don't think is going to make a ton of money, but critics are on its side. Uh, we'll be playing the Rotten Tomatoes game earlier or later, <laughs> but, uh, until then my thought on it, I mean, so the movie follows, it, it's kind of like a deranged high school movie. It's kind of taken a cue from movies like Heather's, you know, mm-hmm. where it's, it's, it's a high school, but it's a very heightened high school. It's kind of, there's a lot of, but I'm a cheerleader in this. Sure. Um, even, uh, it, it's, it's very much, mo- I was mm-hmm. gonna say even a direct, uh, call out to that film uh, yeah. point to be sure. Although for me, uh, and, and Wet Hot American Summer, I think the thing that I was definitely, and, which by the way, you know, the, the, the Elizabeth Banks uh, connection. Oh, there, yeah. Uh, who produced, co-produced the movie mm-hmm. um, and Wet Hot American Summer is obviously a, anyway, I, I think that like, it, there were times when I was watching this and I was kind of like, man, it kind of makes me want to watch, but I'm a cheerleader instead. But uh, that, that has a lot to do with, I think, I, how much I love that movie. Sure. Uh, truly one of my favorites. Uh, in terms of at least like any kind of like coming of age romantic comedy uh, set in high school. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, uh, this movie is kind of like in this, it's it's a Gen Z movie, you know, yeah. it's very much geared toward the Gen Z experience. It's heightened in terms of like, it's, it's the real world, but it's like, things aren't quite that. It, it's very like a uh, fantasy logic at times. And it's a very like, uh, you know, it's got a lot of not another teen movie, mm. like a lot of the way that movie works. Yes. Yeah. 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 Which again, a movie that I I personally like more. I think is just a more successful comedy, sure. and just in terms of what makes what made me laugh uh, a sheer amount of times. But I, it's tough because like I love what this movie is trying to be. I think the trailer for this movie absolutely sold me. The idea is that you have these two kind of burnout lesbians in this high school, who they're played by Rachel Sennett and Io Debris. Edebri, Adebri. I don't know if I can pronounce her name right. Apologies. I think it's Adebri. Uh, and I could very. I mean, Adebri, maybe. I, I think it's Adebri, uh, so, but again, I am <laughs> the farthest <laughs> thing from a name correctly pronounced. I mess it up too. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so they're 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 lesbians in a high school where like okay, being gay isn't the same as like like being queer at least. Like it's not the same sort of like stigma in uh, the high school environment that it was. Uh, for us growing up, right? Sure. Even just a generation ago. Nowadays, like, they, and they established this early on in the film. It's like being gay, like you can be cool or you can be a loser. It, it's it doesn't really matter. But like, they're still bullied because they're like they're perceived losers, right? And they both have crushes on these cheerleaders. Uh, one of them's played by Havana Rose Liu, and the other one's played by Kaya Gerber. And they really want to like talk to these cheerleaders and like, you know, do the typical high school teen thing, right? In all the high school teen movies, American Pie, Sex Drive, like super bad. Like the the idea is that they want to have sex with them, but they don't know how to like get into their world in a graceful way. So they, after a bunch of uh, a series of misunderstandings uh, involving one of their sort of like friends they hate, I guess, um, played by Ruby Cruz, who's probably my favorite character in this. They contrive this, what they call a David Fincher club, uh, but it's really a fight club and they avoid calling it that, but it's like a self-defense club for women. Uh, Everybody at the school starts to think that they went to juvie, even though they didn't. So the girls want to go into this fight club to learn how to defend themselves because they think the lesbian girls are really tough, I guess. And so the movie kind of swerves around there. You have Marshawn Lynch as their advisor who apparently like ad libbed a lot of his lines. Oh, man. And yeah, yeah. And uh, you have music from Charlie XCX. You just, you have this like very interesting setup for a movie that really seems to like be aiming for like a, this is a movie of the moment, mm-hmm. you know, this is our book smart, you know, but for the next, it's like the next kind of book smart sure. thing. Right. And, um, I, I am seeing everybody really like this movie in, in the theater that I watched this. I saw this at the Alamo draft house, great environment to watch a movie like this. It wasn't super packed, unfortunately, but there was a crowd, there were people there and people were laughing. This is San Francisco. You know, people were there to have a good time. And I think people did. And I was the one sitting there just being like, I'm not connecting with this. I don't find it very funny. I don't like this. 
the way this story is moving. Like, I really like the girls. Like, I really like Senate's character, Adibi's character. I thought it was great. And I, I connected with them. I thought they had really good chemistry with each other. And I think Adibri had good chemistry with Havana, Rose Liu. And I was like, I, I like these characters. It's just like something about the writing threw me off. Like a lot of the jokes were coming in. I'm like, that, that's not that funny. Like, but, but it, it, it's set up like it's, it's the perfect setup to a really good joke. In fact, they even have this part where they're showing bloopers at the end of the movie. A lot of those jokes, including one involving like the, the main jock guy in the cafeteria, I thought that was way funnier than what they ended up with. And I was kind of like, oh man, like why couldn't the whole movie be that? Um, so yeah, I just kind of came away from it. Like I didn't hate it or anything. I was just very like middling with it. I, I, it just didn't really hit me very much. Now I know you're going to shout the praises for a certain set piece that happens toward the end of the movie. Yes. It's fun to watch. Like I'm not going to be a stickler for it, but yeah, I, it, it just wasn't, it just wasn't my bag. I don't know what happened. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm out of touch or the children. Are yeah. <laughs> um, I do think, I don't know. I mean, your opinion's your own. I mean, I'm not trying to, uh, belittle that in any way, but um, I, I do think there is, like you said, there is something about this being a Gen Z movie for or Gen Z in a way that, like, it's very easy to compare this to Book Smart. Certainly, I, I feel like uh, Bombs is taking at least some cues from Book Smart. Um, but I feel like that movie, not to be like ages, but uh, I, that is a movie like from millennials for Gen Z. And I feel like that movie. Well, I mean, I still like it more than I don't. I feel like rewatching it um, before uh, Don't Worry, Darling last year, it, it did really strike me as like, this is a movie that is undeniably uh, a 2019 film. Like, it's the most 2019 film ever 2019. And that's not to say, uh, you know, that that makes it worse or anything. But I just feel like it's already kind of dated in a way that I feel like Bottoms is probably going to resonate more. And I mean, I'm no uh, fortune seer. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, but I just feel like this movie, as you've been suggesting, feels a little bit more attuned to this new generation, the sensibilities they're in. And I really like this movie, uh, as you're saying, like it does take cues from something like uh, Wet Hot American Summer or uh, Not Another Teen Movie, which are parodies, but this is like, still kind of playing it a little straight like it's i mean i think that's what's throwing me off uh obviously it's not playing straight <laughs> uh you know no yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. um <laughs> if you catch my drift but um i think it's like kind of trying to do something in between i i think personally i would have preferred if it kind of went for the looniness of something like wet hot or not another team movie as opposed to like kind of be a little bit ground i think that's where the movie kind of loses some of its short footing at times but I just love this movie just, you know, comes in and is just like, look, we've all seen high school movies before. We don't really need to, like, make these characters feel real. We're going to make this world feel heightened. And that's the same with, like, Booksmart. But I feel like that movie, I don't know, I, I feel like it doesn't really satirize the characters as much as something like this does. Like, it's a lot more, I think, attuned to the, those uh, stereotypes and archetypes in a way that it just seems like it has, as I've heard some people say, like, kind of like the sleepover energy where it's like, and then yeah. this happens. Book self, then, Booksmart yeah. takes itself seriously. A little bit more, yeah. I mean, I think that's obviously going for like a zaniness, but I think it also wants to be kind of more of a, um, I don't want to say like a John Hughes kind of thing, but like maybe something a little bit more like super bad, obviously. It's definitely very, like that movie has some kind of wild and out sequences, but it's still kind of centered in an emotional way. I think that movie is trying to do the same. This is not kind of going for that entirely, but also still kind of is i i feel like i would have preferred if it didn't do that at all but at the same time i think that sensibility also lends itself uh to some of the uh funnier scenes in the film particularly a music uh cue a needle drop that uh i think is pretty perfect it has some <laughs> really funny uh montage sequences there but um yeah i mean i get i think i get where you're coming from i'm not gonna say that this movie is flawless or a masterpiece or anything. I think it's definitely not as polished as something like book smart. I think it's not quite as, uh, sure footed as maybe something like wet hot American summer is. And it's its own brand of lunacy, but I think it is appealingly kind of go for broke in a way that just felt refreshingly funny for me. Someone who 
hasn't really been jiving with a lot of the comedies I've seen this summer in the theater. I feel like, you know, coming off of, uh, you know, Strays and, uh, you know, Joyride and No Hard Feelings, I kept being like, am I, like, becoming a stooge? Like, am I just not really, like, uh, a, you know, uh, it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, am I not really, um, you know... You need a little bit of a grump I don't know, or like, something? Or is my funny bone, uh, you know... Out of, out of socket or something but yeah i mean i don't I, like this movie just kind of felt refreshed like okay you can do something that is totally zany and and, and really heartfelt and, and willing to feel progressive in the sense like it's doing something that feels like a new generation is really thriving and and for all it's like kinks and uh you know things that don't quite work i think the things that do work are really charming and uh appealing and i mean i can you know if you don't find it funny that's that you know that's all subjective i can't really you know, argue against it or not, but, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just, I, I found this movie, you know, like, uh, I've been saying, like, it's like a handful of water in the Sahara desert. Like, I'm just like, yes, finally something nourishing. It's not, you know, a cup or a jug, but it's a, it's a good solid handful. It's going to get me, uh, some hydrogen, you know, it's going to get me, uh, energized and, and feeling good about the state of comedy right now. And, you know, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm neglecting something like Barbie, which also felt right, very refreshing in that respect, but uh, yeah, I thought that movie was funny. I see that's where we tend to divide a bit because I thought it was a good summer for comedies. I, I mean, I didn't like no hard feelings or strays, but I really liked joy ride. I thought Barbie was quite good. So, you know, there were, I thought there were some good stuff. There were good comedies coming out. But yeah, I, you know, we, we just disagree on that. And I think like your reaction to Joyride kind of reminds me of my reaction to this. And it's just so confusing to me because <laughs> honestly, honestly, like I, I'm watching this movie and I'm like, I normally find Gen Z pretty funny. And I think sure. this movie does use a lot of like Gen Z humor. Mm-hmm. So like, I'm not sure what's going on there. If it's just like something's not clicking, but, um, you know, and, and the other thing too, is that like, I mean, Emma Seligman and Rachel Sennett, they're on the older side, uh, in terms of like Gen Z, yeah. they're not quite, you know, like, but I mean, that's obviously a far, far cry from like book smart. <laughs> Olivia Wilde was in her like, like, like mid thirties or something when she made that movie. But, right. uh, I, I guess like the feeling I get is, you know, is, is that kind of the, what the reaction might've been to, but I'm a cheerleader when that came out and, you know, like, it, but obviously that resonated with people my age. Like when I saw that movie in middle school, I thought that movie was genius. And, you know, like, I wonder if there were people, you know, my age now who were kind of like, but it didn't make me laugh, but it didn't matter. I mean, like I ended up, you know, cherishing and treasuring that movie forever. You know what I mean? And, you know, I, I could see that happening with bottoms. I could see that. You know, I think some people will probably do that. That's smart. People will just do that with movies, no matter what. Uh, people will probably do that with strays. But what do we know? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Anything's possible. Sure. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm happy this movie, even though it didn't work for me, I, I'm happy that it's finding some success because I think this is a really good cast. I would have been really bummed if this had tanked and I didn't like it because that would have been a, a big hit, I think, for Senate and Seligman and the, some of the people involved. I think Edebree is like on a bit of like a, an ascent sure. right now. Her work on The Bear, obviously, she's been in a lot of things. I mean, Theater Camp, uh, the other comedy I really liked this summer that didn't work for you. I mean, I'm well, in the enviable position, aren't I? Because I liked a bunch of stuff comedy-wise this year. And this is like the one that you were like happier about, I guess. Sure. I, I will say uh, I didn't dislike Theater Camp. I thought it was fine. Like, I, I thought it was all right. But I do think it's sure. one of those movies that I think it's, I think, better as a film than as a comedy, I guess. Even though I still have some gripes about uh, the way it's kind of flippant with uh, its rules in the mockumentary genre, but that's just me being a stickler for those kind of things. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I mean, and you, you didn't see it, but um, she's obviously also on the rise because of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie she was mm-hmm. in uh, just recently. But Across the Spider-Verse sure. as well, um, she voiced in, and she also, she was in Abbott Elementary um, for at least a few episodes. Uh, she worked on, like one of her first things was she worked on Dickinson, and that's where she met Christopher Storer and would end up, you know, working on uh, The Bear. Mm. And I know you haven't seen The Bear yet, but I mean, season two is just like, she is so, so good in that show. Now, my thing with her is that I think that she's a tremendous actor, both comedically and dramatically. But I think the best stuff I've seen from her so far has been dramatically. And I think Theater Camp is like a movie where I didn't think she was the funniest person 
in it. Like I, I didn't think she was super funny, but I think she was in a funny situation in that movie and she kind of gets underutilized there. But I think that's just the writing. I felt like she just didn't really get a lot of time to shine in that movie. Like she's like mm-hmm. kind of like the third, you know, third tier story and they kind of just didn't really know how to utilize her. Exactly. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think she, you know, did what she could with it. I, I don't think she, like, uh, you know, faltered in any respect there. But she was also, she has an uncredited role, by the way, in uh, S-House, the Cooper Rafe movie. I don't want to swear and then get us docked, but yeah. I mean, um, can we not even say PG swears? I guess not. I mean, I don't know, Will. This ain't, this ain't the uh, the MCAA or whatever it's called. I, I'm just trying to get through well, this this day. I mean, do you? The, I thought you choose if whether or not it's explicit. It, it, is it I, Apple or how does that work? You, it can affect our downloads. I'm just trying everything I can. You could just, you know, you could say S, you know. Did I say Chai Tea e- House? No, okay. no, I was going to say, well, uh, S-H-I Hockey. Or what, is, what is it? Double Hockey? Double Hockey Sticks, yeah. Double yeah. Hockey Sticks, but that doesn't work. That's H-E-W, whatever. Oh. Okay. Uh, oh, Let's, okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, all to say, Debrie is, I think, very Debrie. I, I, man, I wish I knew how to pronounce her name correctly. Um, I, I see a pronunciation right here. I O I O a Debrie. I O a Debrie. Well, the good thing is that okay. she's such uh, a star on the rise that it will only be a matter of time before yeah. we know how to say it. Yes. So apologies for that. Um, but yeah, I think that what's interesting about her character in this movie. I mean, she's kind of the reluctant best friend. You know, she's kind of the one who's kind of going along with things. Something I did like about the way the movie's constructed is you have Senate as sort of the one who's like, she's a bit of the Cartman in this situation. The, the, the one who's like, you know, she's the Cooper to, um, to the Cobb, Cobb, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Where she's a little bit more of like, she's scheming a little bit. She's a little bit more like, I'm going to get into this situation where I'm going to provoke this wild situation. And the Debris character, a Debris character is like, oh, I don't know about it. But then she kind of like falls into it and she starts to like it too. I think that's where the movie worked the most for me was like watching their energies. Like they felt like people who knew each other for a long time and it was easy for me to like step into their lives for an yeah. hour or so. And, 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 and oh, by the way, 88 minute runtime. I think that's also a big, big factor oh, sure. in why this movie is yeah, working yeah. so well for critics. Because I mean, critics are like, thank you for not taking too long to get to the point. That's one of the best things I think so far about, uh, how do you pronounce your last name, Emma? Seligman, uh, Seligman. I think it's Emma Seligman. Seligman, okay. Yeah, she just she just knows how to make a you know lean yeah. and mean. Sugar baby was the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. And um, I, I just you know, okay. Uh, by the way, Seligman, I, I, you know, she wanted to originally be a film critic uh, before she became a screenwriter because she was a big fan of uh, Roger Ebert. So, well, fun there. She actually, I think, wrote film reviews for a little while. Um, also. Did go to NYU, called it, uh, graduated in 2017. <laughs> anyway, um, no, I like these two friends. If, if there was something that I thought was a little bit undercooked, I liked the cheerleader characters. I kind of wanted a little bit more. I felt like there was something kind of missing um, from them and like what was going on in their heads. And I think the movie was treating it as like a, oh, what's going to happen? You know, are they going to return the feelings or whatever? And they kind of like skirt over a lot of the, I guess like chemistry building that happens between them. And I kind of get like the idea behind it. They're kind of doing it, I guess in a way like, but I'm a cheerleader had like a montage sort of thing, but I don't know. I felt like, but I'm a cheerleader had nice beats where like when the characters were talking to each other, like the ones who were going to like each other, I don't know. I felt like it was a bit of more believable leap into that. And and maybe though, that's just how it is in Gen Z. Is that how people get courted? Will Ashton? Um, well, I'm definitely you no, know, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm definitely no expert in that respect, but um, I'm just saying you're younger than me a little bit. Right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, but no, I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think it's intentional as far as Sanat and Garber, as far as like, it's obviously a one-sided crush. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think they play it out appropriately, but, um, as far as, uh, the relationship between AO and, um, Haley Lou, uh, what's her last name? Havana H- Rose Lee. Oh, so far, you Havana. A bit off. I'm thinking of Haley Lou Richardson. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, yeah, it, 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 it had, it was definitely the relationship the movie cared about more. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, it was really, mm-hmm. I mean, like that diner scene that we're kind of alluding to is, uh, I don't know. I, I found it pretty 
authentic in a, in a way that like the film generally wasn't That's tried fair. and uh you know I, I felt like it was heartfelt and, and i think as you were su- just suggesting that um a debris really kind of sells the like comedic and dramatic uh, urgency of that scene pretty well and i think definitely i mean um you you were saying it already but i i think she is really the like shining star of the film i think it may have been intended as a yeah. star vehicle for Sana, but um, you know, I think she's the one that kind of walks away with this movie. All she steals yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, totally steals it because she's the heart of the movie. And I don't think like there are a bunch of gags that are given to Senate, but I don't think she always lands them as strong without uh, a debris kind of backing her up. And so they work really well together. Like I think that they're they're a recipe for success. But I very much like you know because you're supposed to have this thing between Senate and um, the Ruby Cruz character too. Um, who's played by Hazel Callahan, or her character's name is Hazel Callahan. And Hazel's like a little bit more sort of like, I don't know, She, the first part of the movie, she has like a certain energy, and then that energy kind of shifts. And she ended up becoming my favorite character only because I thought she was the most interestingly written. Like, I don't know, she felt the most real to me, but in a way it almost sort of stuck out. Sure. Uh, st- stood out yeah um because it, it was almost like she was in a different movie for a little bit but then the movie kind of finds its footing with her again toward the end so i was a little bit okay with it um so overall i think it worked i guess i feel like i would have to watch this movie again to kind of maybe with like knowing what happens like in having that in mind um also there are the other fight club characters who are just you know one joke characters sure. which is fine yeah you know, i mean there's our black republican well, and there's the one who wants to kill her stepdad because we're in thoroughbreds yeah yeah i mean well you can't spoil two of the better jokes in the movie but uh was that a spoiler i think so i mean you, i feel like doesn't the trailer reveal that i don't know I, I i didn't get to say it earlier but i went into this cold i mean obviously i was already sold on it so i didn't watch the trailer i didn't see any promotional things for it other than like a couple stills so i didn't I think I watched the trailer after the fact, but I didn't. It didn't, you know, register in my mm. brain. I, I I don't think they reveal that in the trailer, though. I could be wrong. I mean, I did see the trailer um, a little bit before I saw the movie, and man, I yeah, the, I think like the timing in the comedic timing in the trailer worked for me more for some reason. Um, particularly Senate's character, I thought had some a, a funnier vibe to her. But yeah, I just yeah, I well, don't know. Maybe maybe the movie caught me at the wrong time or something. Maybe if I watched it again and you know, I, I was I had a little bit of alcohol, I had a little bit sure. of stuff going on. Uh, maybe that's the problem. I should have watched it sober. Hi. What um, do I do? Well, I, I mean, I had a couple beers beforehand, so I can't say I watched it totally. Oh, you had sober. a couple. I had a couple during. Oh, okay. Who knows? Oh. Uh, I mean, I I also had some during Joyride, so. Oh, well, 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 you don't. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I probably need a whole uh, step. Yeah, yeah, you know, right? bragging about your drinking. <laughs> yeah, bragging. That's it. Yeah. Um, uh, so okay. Yeah, I mean, as far as the side characters go, there's something about it. Um, I think it's this is intentional, but I kind of like that they uh, are like unknowingly kind of replicating the events of Fight Club. Uh, obviously not like with the twist, but, um, you know, like in a way that they're like kind of less like unbeknownst to them kind of following the steps of anarchy that ensue in that film. <laughs> and I find, like, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know, like, like, like stuff like that, like it feels like that sleepover energy. I, I just like, it's like, and then like ship blows up real good. I just like that. Like this movie is willing to kind of be like, yeah, it's not far enough. Let's go for it. Um, and there's also just really funny stuff with, uh, I, like I like that the the football team is like revered like their saints. Like there's even uh, I won't spoil, it, but there's a, a really really funny mural um, in the background, and like there's one point where like the football team uh, is laid out like you know like the Last Supper, which is just really really yeah. like something like that's just like I, I feels very inspired. It's very funny, um, you know. Like I I think you know not the shortchange you know the guys. I mean I think they they also give some. Like, obviously, the um, I, I don't know who they are, unfortunately, but, um, you know, I, I have them here. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah so, uh, so I can't look up their names, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I, I got your back. You know how I do oh, it. Uh, so Nicholas, <laughs> Nicholas Galit- Galitzine uh, plays Jeff, uh, the main guy. Yeah. And Miles Fowler uh, plays his friend who I, I didn't love them their characters as much as i wanted to again there were there were like bloopers for the end where i found them funnier See, um, you keep bringing up the bloopers yeah. i'm glad i mean it it warms like my it? heart 
they included a blooper reel, but I didn't think the bloopers. I love bloopers. Had I thought that was some of the weakest stuff in the film. Uh, ultimately, like we're, we're such different people, I Ashton. I mean, that's what it comes down to, sure. huh? You know, we need our yeah. own fight club. I'm, I'm rubber, you're glue. Yeah, or whatever. Um, it would be an art fight club. I have a, uh, would Maverick join? I, I would assume so. Okay. We'd have to convince him that he would be the reluctant. You know, we would have to convince sure. him. You know what I mean? Well, I thought Corey I thought would, be, would the be the reluctant one because he's such a pacifist. Mm. I feel like Charlie. Corey's a pacifist. Matt's not. I I don't know. You would have to coax Matt as well. I feel like Chris would just be in it no matter what. Like we wouldn't even. Have to... <laughs> he's just like I'm in. You have to tell him right. who was it. Yeah, it's like hey, we're forming a club. I'm in. Like, All right. Well, for the people who don't know who these people are, let's. Uh, I have a positive review and a negative review. Of bottoms. I'll start with the negative. Okay. Because we're a positive show. Uh, so this is from KYK on Letterboxd. Io Debris delivery is the only thing I liked about this. The only parts that really made me laugh. She's a comedy star in a movie that mostly made me go, mm. woman next to me kept audibly gasping, and I wish this did that for me too, but it wasn't that provocative or interesting. All which would be forgivable if it had good jokes or something. I think the disconnect happened because the film lands in a weird middle area of being neither that real nor that absurdist. Go in one or the other direction or hell, both. So yeah, I guess kind of echoing my criticism, but I think way harsher. So she gave it two stars. I would not give it two stars. Sure. I, this to me is like a two and a half bordering on three stars. It's it's a tough one for me because I respect it, the movie, a lot more than I liked it. But I think those criticisms are about where I'm at. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of echoed some of the things I said. I mean, even though I'm certainly much kinder on it, I, I agree that I think it doesn't quite get that balance quite right. I think it would be better off just leaning more into the lunacy as opposed to like trying to have a kind of more of an emotional center that I don't think it quite fully earns. But I do think uh, it is helped by, as we've been mentioning, Rachel and Ao having genuine innate chemistry and kind of selling those beats, even if they are a little... Uh, half-hearted in their approach i think but um yeah i mean i i think that's something that uh, i know you don't uh like richard brody but i really think you should read his <laughs> review because i think you'd be nodding and be like like even though i don't fully agree with his review I, I, he comes from an understandable place and i think he helped me understand where you were coming from a little bit better but he made an interesting point that um he, this movie is gonna maybe be like a modern day like saint almost fire as far as like you know, that's not like a great movie or anything, but like the cast, you know, goes hey, on. Speak so, for yourself. I mean, I, don't, I, I admit I'd never finished St. Elmo's Fire. Uh, what? But I, I, Will I, I wanted to because. The soundtrack alone. I, I mean, I don't know about that, but the, the screenwriter is from Pittsburgh, I know. So I, I've always been interested to finish it. Uh, but yeah, I, I had, your loyalties continue to baffle me to this day. But you know what I mean, though, where it's like that cast, uh, you know, like they went on to be like the like the rat pack, yes, the yes. Yeah. rob low yeah. yeah 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 um yeah i just feel like uh you know i, I think obviously bottoms from what i've seen of saint Elmo's fire obviously i i need to uh see the movie in full to have a objective opinion of it uh especially if you're going to put me in the hot seat about it but I, I think you know there is something interesting to be said about like i think these stars and these filmmakers are only going to continue to do bigger and better things as they move forward and uh you know i, I obviously have a, a warm affection spot for this movie I, I don't think it's perfect by any means but it does feel like you said like a genuine kind of cult classic that the uh the faults i think add to the charm for me and i think it, it makes it a very endearing experience uh but i think yeah i mean i think the best work for these stars is still ahead of them and uh yeah i'm i'm excited to see where they go next well, we still have the positive review, Will Ashton. You really went into a tear there. Sure. Um, but that's well, you get great. Me upset. Uh, so, you keep being uh, like, <laughs> what, is you, what do you think? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this positive review is from Bobby Finger. I mean, we don't have to start a fight club to, to settle this, do we? Um, so Bobby gave it four stars on Letterboxd. The rare high school comedy that invents its own stylish, idiosyncratic universe instead of trying and failing to approximate our own. Funny, assured, and thrillingly weird. Maybe I'm just a grumpy millennial, but I love that everything happens to everyone in person. The brutal physicality of their fights, fight club, their plain old, plus their plain old fights, renders phones, internet, and social media pretty much worthless. Who needs any of that S-H-I-T when you're busy punching people <laughs> in the face? This movie rocks. And, and I agree. Like I think that is one of the strongest things about the movie is the fact that it's it's not trying to communicate to Gen Z through the filter of technology because I just feel like 
technology is background noise yes. at this point. And it's sort of like what you do, our lives are constantly that. And it's refreshing to have a movie based around, yeah, the physicality of life itself. That is something there's a more fear of an unknown kind of thing there. Whereas like to us millennials, technology is a little bit more of something present in our minds of like to be the subject of something because we witness the transition a little bit more viscerally than Gen Z and the, the generation after that even more pronounced. Mm. So I think that's spot on. I mean, I think, again, that's why the movie caught my attention because I was like, oh, we're not getting like a cyber bullying movie. Like people are actually like attacking each other. And it's like, it's kind of going for broken that way. Yeah. So I, I agree with this review in terms of like what works about the movie, just for me I'll do a lesser degree. But uh, I, again, that's why I admire this movie a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought it up because I feel like that comes into my perspective of why I like the pacing of this film, even though it can be, a little abrasive and you kind of have to settle into its groove a little bit. It does feel like its perspective on technology is not like, you know, characters constantly having their phones out and like, we're like seeing 5 billion text messages on screen or whatever, but rather the yeah. immediacy of it, like the fact that these characters have grown up in the internet age and they they process things much faster, you know, like they're just a lot more receptive to things. Like we've talked about before, like, uh, you always tell me about like anime is a little bit more, uh, popular now with like gen, Z because I think they have are just used to like, you know, having things come in a fast clip, like processing things super fast and stuff like that. And I think that's like why this movie really, uh, you know, fits for this like next generation that we're yeah. being like, it, it just feels like it has that innate understanding and that ability to be like, we're not going to bog this film down with like knowing anything about the family lives of these two characters or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like playing into like obvious tropes, like bogging the movie down with like, things the audience is probably well aware of having seen 500,000 uh, high school movies by this point. Um, well, and also tropes and like what makes somebody nerdy in this movie, the stuff that makes them nerdy isn't being there. It's not, they're not being not that they're geeks or pop culture geeks, because in this age, everybody's a pop culture geek. Everybody watches things sure. like anime, reality TV. People are obsessed with things. People are online all the time. The thing that makes you nerdy and this is like being horny. <laughs> like, I think that's kind of what it comes down to. It's like these two girls are like clearly like desperate for, you know, they're, they have a little bit of like that desperation energy to them. And I think that's what sells them in this movie as like unappealing or at least like that lack of confidence of like they feel so ostracized because it just feels like the rest of the world doesn't click with their energies mm -hmm. and that to me is like the definitely more like aligned with what that sort of what's going on today uh based on my very limited understanding of what's going on today to be clear yeah i mean uh definitely yeah I, I i'm glad you said that but i do not want to shortchange uh, as this review has noted the uh, the violence of the film, which we kind of alluded to earlier, and we haven't really discussed yet. I mean, if you're well, going to want to give stuff away, you said earlier not to be spoilery, right? I mean, well, I'm not. I'm gonna, you know, not reveal anything, obviously. But, um, you know, I mean, if you're going to, you know, borrow some cues from Fight Club, you have to have, you know, some blood on the mat, and uh, obviously, uh, we get this climax that is just totally, as we've been saying, go for broke, outlandish, and and one of the funnier uh, climaxes, I think, uh, that I've seen in some time at, at the movies. Uh, I just love how, uh, you know, kind of audacious it gets there, how untethered to reality it is in those moments. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's maybe the, the most violent, uh, or one of the most violent climaxes in a comedy I've seen since something like Observe and Report, a uh, movie mm -hmm. I really, really love, uh, even though I, I imagine, I, I don't know what, but, uh, Gen Z, would even I haven't seen that movie since it came out. I don't even know what Gen, a long time ago. I don't know what Gen Z would think about observing report. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, could that could swing swing anyway? I, I honestly, but um, but yeah, I mean, I just I love uh, a movie's commitment to just like you know saying screw it, we're just gonna do this. Uh, it just kind of adds to the end then energy as as we've been kind of alluding to, and uh, yeah, I just think uh, that alone just really I think sold the movie uh, for me as far as like okay. This clearly is going to be uh, a film that's going to resonate, I think, for people. All right, let's play the Rotten Tomatoes game. We have 154 reviews counted, and you have a bit of a leg up on this one because you already have an idea of how uh, popular this movie has been with critics. Sure. So, but what's your best guess? Let's see if you can do it. This has been this has been uh, a hard one not to get spoiled on because I feel like a lot of people, uh, as mm. you've been mentioning, have been talking about the high critical reception of the film. Uh, I, I know at the very, very least it's in the 90s. I think it's in the, the high 90s. Um, I don't know if 
uh, it's like something like 98 or 99, like something like Booksmart got on its initial release because I feel like, like you said, the weirdness of it, the the overhyping maybe have brought it down a little bit, but I don't think enough to make it any anywhere less than like 96%. So I'm going to say 96%. 96% is what Booksmart has right now. Ooh. Uh, funny enough, this movie is a couple points lower. It's 94%. Okay. So very close. And yeah, I think, you know, to to what you're saying, it was much higher. I think at a certain point, I remember seeing it was around 98. And then the, the you know, the grumpy, the Scrooges like me started showing up. You and, started and, uh, coming along. and Richard Brody. Just yeah, me and Rich. <laughs> arms folded. Um, yeah, I mean, there are only 10 rotten reviews. Um, and I didn't uh, write a review for this movie. Um, I didn't go to a screening for it. I saw it at a public screening, but like yeah, I don't even really... you are, I guess. <laughs> I don't like how <laughs> yeah, you were yeah. like, I had Richard... to see it in a public screening, a public school. Uh, Richard he... Brody's not on the, on the rotten list though. I don't know yeah. if he ended up giving it a positive rating, even though, you know, I don't know. But, um, yeah. Cause like New York post is like in time magazine and Hollywood reporter are the most notable, um outlets that gave it a negative gave it a negative review and they're all like you know time magazine it was like a or not time magazine but uh, new york post gave it a two out of four so yeah um, yeah anyway audience score yeah win some lose i, I don't mean know. i don't know i feel like uh they're they're kind of contrarians you know uh you know the can new york be, post. I mean, hollywood reporter right? no no I, i'm at the new york post i i, I don't think hollywood reporter is is a contrarian Ah, New York Post. I never take them very seriously sure. myself. Um, Who wrote that review? But all right, uh, was it Cal Smith or what, what's that guy's name? Uh, for New York Post, yeah, um, that would be uh, Johnny Ole- Ole- Oleksinki, who uh, I'm not as familiar. Yeah, with. I don't know that guy. But uh, or, yeah. yeah, for audience score, we have 250 plus verified ratings. What do you got? This one's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I could see a scenario where audiences are even higher than critics and i can also see a scenario where uh audiences are even lower because you know like you said they they came in with these uh you know expectations already laid out for them and they you know i I don't think you're an outliner as far as people you know being like i don't know that wasn't quite uh up to snuff like it wasn't what uh you know not that great geez relax that's kind of how i've been feeling but yeah but you know my gut says that higher than the uh critic score right now i'm gonna say 95 percent. your gut is wrong oh, okay. it's lower it's 90 percent. and i was worried i gave you a little bit of a hint there but yeah i do think there are some people who are like ah it's, it's getting overhyped and I, I don't know what the audience score was before like the movie started like you know, we started getting the ultimate back, you know, sorry, I should say the inevitable backlash, right? You know, the, the whole thing of like, you know, people need to start being edgy about it. Sure. Um, I mean, there's no cinema score, but uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, I feel like there's this desire now in, in the internet age where like people instantly want to claim something as like a cult film. And it's like one of those things where it's like you can't, like it has to be, like it can't just like have that mm. label thrown onto it. Like I think, I think it has to earn that in some respects. And I feel like that can sometimes, you know, like for a film like this backfire where it's like people coming out of the theater day one are like, that's a cult classic, even though obviously, you know, it's, it seems to be doing okay at the box office and critically it's, it's very well received. Like, I, I don't, I don't know how much it has going against it at this point to, to make it a cult classic or not. But yeah, I mean, I think that is something that kind of burdens a film like this or burdens a film like Booksmart is that people are so quick to kind of jump to that label that, you know, may hurt the film's uh, reputation in some respects. There you go. Um, on So we don't have cinema score, but I think that's okay because this feels more like a movie designed for Letterboxd, um, or at least people who use Letterboxd. Sure. Uh, Io I, Adibri, but I should mention, uh, is a, a well-known Letterboxd user. Uh, she gave the movie five stars and said, I'm in it with my friends, so <laughs> which I appreciate. Yeah. Uh, go, go do that, please. Um, it has 110,000 watches. That's a lot for a, a small budget movie like this and for a movie that, you know, like... We, we talk about movies on here, like big movies, you know, that maybe get like 30,000, 40,000 on Letterboxd. Uh, this is not for the, for the I guess, the normie crowd, for lack of a better word. Uh, this is also already in the Letterboxd top 250. That's a big 
hit, oh, yeah. uh, a big hint for you. It's number 167 right now as we're recording this. Um, but, Will, can you guess the average rating? You got a lot of hints for this one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's certainly not low. I mean, obviously, if it's in the top uh, 250 already. And that's with the mm-hmm. new system that they have to like prevent something like uh, Cross the Spider-Verse from being, you know, higher rated than like Citizen Kane or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it has to be like 4.7 or something like outrageous like that. It's it's a bit lower. No, it's 4.3. Um, I think that because you were in the Sahara Desert and you were gulping that water, I think you got a little overzealous from how thirsty you were. I've been seeing uh, um, Mirage. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the stars uh, instead of uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, and I, I kind of want to. I, I, just, I know your letterbox review. You already mentioned a lot of the same points uh, that you already talked about sure. here. I had a couple in mind that I didn't. I didn't really mention that are a little bit mean. Um, I said this is pretty mid for a movie called Bottoms. Please clap. Uh, <laughs> this is just R-rated Glee, which I stand by. That's, um, that has to be one of the worst things you've ever written on like. <laughs> That's uh, worse the worst than your uh, where the crawdads things review. <laughs> I, I also wrote uh, the worst best Avril Lavigne needle drop, um, which I guess I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, yeah, I said that. this one's a little bit more serious, but uh, well, I think you liked the needle drop more than I did. Uh, I said the worst best. I see. Like of the best Avril Lavigne needle drops, it's the worst. Um, I said th- this is a little bit more serious. The movie is frustrating because most of it sucks, but then all of a sudden, without warning, it'll be good for like 15 seconds. That's how I felt. I felt like I was getting whipped around because I was like, I'd like this. This is good. And then I wouldn't like so, it for a bunch. It was annoying. Okay, so, I mean, we haven't really talked about, like, what are the things that, like, really work for you as, as opposed to the things that didn't about this? I feel like I already talked about it. I don't know. I mean, like, like what's, like, the because scene? The premise, uh, like, seeing the characters kind of, like, the way, the way they relate with each other, the chemistry between the leads. Um, I think like ha- the construction of the jokes and like the, some of the stuff you mentioned too, the way that the the jocks are like held up as like saints, like conceptually, I like the movie. Like I like the way the movie kind of moves too. It's pretty fast. It's just like when you, you end the scene with the, it's the punchlines. Like, I just don't think the movie delivers like in those moments as well. You, Every once in a while it did for me, but you like the ingredients, yeah. but you don't like, the end product that comes out of the other. It's a good way to put it. And, and and it's tough because like when I say it's an R-rated Glee, that should be something that's got me, it should have me excited because I think that Glee is so unhinged. Glee, Glee is a show about horrific, horrible people. It's kind of what makes the show addicting is you're watching bad people um, think that they're the main character. And in this movie, it's like, there's some of that, but like I couldn't even I, I couldn't laugh at the movie because I don't think the movie was that unhinged necessarily. It's it's hard for me to to get that that thought straight, I guess. But I, I don't know. I'm, I'm glad the characters didn't break out in a song. That would have been bad. Oh, I, I would have uh, been for that. A spontaneous sure. musical number. I think it worked. Hey, look, you know what? It worked in Barbie. You're right. You're right. Sure. Why not? Um, but yeah, that's that's where I'm at on bottoms. Uh, Wait, and it, for me, it, it doesn't come out on top. There is a musical number in this film. There is. Yeah. Did I forget? Yeah, remember uh, in the um, like in the middle of the film, it, it's hard for me to not spoil it. But um, you know, there's one character belting out a certain song. That's not a music. That's not really a musical. I, 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 well. I, we're, we're talking about like a, a you know like music coming from nowhere. No, 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 no you're, you're stretching. You're stretching the rules a little bit, but that, that's okay. So you're right. All right. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk about, um, I don't know what, I mean, we both saw the nun too. Uh, I think haunting in Venice is the next big release. Um, we chose to talk about bottoms cause we were late and sure. I think that, you know, none two did well at the box office, but I mean, I don't have a ton to say about it. I wrote a review. Well, it, I don't know. I'm planning to see, uh, double feature tomorrow of The Nun 2 and A Haunting in Venice. We could either do two short episodes of both, or we can just kind of do one big episode about both films. I think that would be a good way to kind of cover each. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll, until then, until then, we'll, uh, those are the things on our radar. I mean, we're not going to talk about my big fat Greek wedding three. I'm sorry, Will. I know you were looking forward to it. And uh, I feel bad, quite honestly. Uh, the movie I'm looking forward to, though, that I really hope we do uh, an episode about, Will Ashton, real quick. Flora and Son, the next John Carney movie. Oh, yeah. I forgot um, about that. I think you know that I'm all about that, right? When does that come out? That comes out September 22nd on Apple TV. Oh, okay. And so, yeah, it's coming up soon. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm excited. Uh, yeah, I mean, I forgot that that was coming out. Uh, that's not getting a theatrical release. It's only on Apple TV. 
I think just Apple TV. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. Don't hold me to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm so really wrong. a new Pablo Rain film coming to Netflix uh, this Friday as well. Lots of stuff to pick from. Sure. But uh, we'll we'll be back. And of course, if you have any suggestions or questions for us, hit us up on the Discord or email us. You know the deal. From the Internet California, I'm John DeGroni. And from the Internet Pennsylvania, I'm Will Ashton. I was going to say, like, uh, uh, like the first rule of Fight Club or like first rule of Cinema You can't talk about Cinema Holics thing, but I wasn't quick enough to figure out where to go with that. So, capitalism. Bye. <laughs>